Oh yeah, five minutes. Yeah, five minutes is late. Or a grief, this is... <laughs> <laughs> so let me introduce Daniel, Daniela Niklas from University of Bamberg. And she will speak about quality matters. Yes, quality matters, we all agree, I think. <laughs> Central data management in large scale. So please, Daniela. Yeah, thank you very much. And it's a pleasure to be here again. And it's a pleasure to talk to you in a, in a program with so many excellent keynotes. Um, a little bit keep up that quality. So um, if I have a title like this, you might expect certain things that I could talk about. So I could talk about quality, of course, it's the first word in the topic. I could talk about sensors, it's occurs, I could talk about sensor data, about data management, it's also part of that long title, or large scale infrastructures. And, and then I could try to find somehow a red thread through all these topics and connect them in a meaningful way. This is what you probably would expect. But still a lot of question marks are open, for example, yeah, quality of what? So we right now are going to talk about quality of service of the quality of the top itself, but what is it? Um, how do you uh, cluster the sensor data management? Is it sensor data management? Mm. Or is it the data management on sensors, like sensor data management? Or do we talk about sensor management? Because if you have a lot of sensors, you have to manage that too. Um, large scale infrastructure. So how big is large scale? Is it bigger than very large? Um, you can kind of try to define the the largeness of the system class we're talking, and the infrastructures for what? So is it data infrastructures or is it real things? So I should clarify also these questions so that I know where I'm talking about, and I will do that too in the But let's start at the end, let's start about the goal, why do we do that stuff, large scale infrastructures? So you can always open Wikipedia, see what an infrastructure is. Uh, so they think it's about roads or bridges, the electrical grid, uh, but also um, like uh, communication infrastructure for the mobile uh, network, for example, power, um, uh, the power generation, um, but also factories, so this is factory hall, or a data center itself could be considered infrastructure because it's just a country, city, or area, uh, and is also necessary for its economy to function. So we see it's physical, real world things. Things you can touch, but you can go to physically and take a picture. And also you see a lot of these infrastructures are very relevant because by definition they are necessary and some of them are even critical and are considered to be critical infrastructures. If they are not there anymore, we go into serious trouble. So the other question is, what means then large scale? Yeah, is it the same as big or very large? So we all know conferences that have a name, like very large databases for, for decades. So obviously, very the size of very large have changed over this year, what we consider a very large database. So some of them say very large is not big enough anymore. We need big data. So um, you could think about, is, is a light bulb or the light system infrastructure is that already very large you can ask for example how many software engineers do we need to change a light bulb yeah. and then the one answer would be no that's a hardware problem yeah. and we don't care for it and sometimes we as software engineers do that we don't care for these real things there's another answer to that and I have it from a very serious source um, the lightbulbjokes.com <laughs> website um, one you just need one software engineer to change a light bulb. But if he changes it, the whole building will probably fall down. And this is a true story about very large uh, infrastructure. Sometimes if you just change a little bit, and if you are a software engineer, just do it, and you don't know about the whole thing, it might break down. So you can define large or very large or large scale or big as many people involved. So it's not about just one person. You need multiple people, that means you always have the communication issue between these people. Um, and the system should be take care of itself a little bit. So you should not allow that just if someone changed one thing, the whole thing breaks down. There should be some measurements against that. Um, it's a complex structure, so you might not see through it. You might not see the effects of changing a light bulb. 
And typically you can define it, especially in research talks, as so large that conventional techniques have problems handling it, and I'll show you which problems, or can't handle it at all, and this is why you need my stuff. So this is the typical definition that people somehow use. Of course, if you talk about conventional techniques, you will see that new techniques become conventional over time, so it will always be a moving target. So right now, just let's assume they are big, they are complex, and maybe we have issues in dealing with them, and I will talk about some of these issues. So, um, why do I combine that topic of large scale infrastructures with sensors? Well, we've seen they are physical, real world, and they are relevant, even critical, and from the second part you can derive, you should monitor them. Yeah, you should have a look at them, whether they still work. You do that during normal operation. Do they still do what it's supposed to do? And especially also effect of changes. You installed something new, you did an update, you, you extended them to a new area. Do they still work? You need to monitor that. Did the change have the desired result? So, of course you could do human monitoring, and that's very important that have people to look at your infrastructures because you have to make experts, they know what they are doing. Um, however, they are expensive, they do not scale back. So if you have effect of changes, um, they might still be very motivated of seeing whether the change that they did really worked, but especially during normal operation, monitoring is a very boring task the infrastructure that it runs, it works very well, and you don't want to, and if you have humans going and seeing whether all the light bulbs are still on, they get bored, and if they are bored, they make errors. So this obviously leads to let us support the humans that monitor things by sensors that do it automatically and that don't get bored. Sensors might not be that good in monitoring the effect of changes, because they might have been designed for other use cases suddenly you change something and they can't monitor it yet. So you have to also um, improve your sensor infrastructure, but for normal operations, they can do a very good job and support the humans. So applications, what type, where can we apply that stuff? So if you take an X, let X be an application, and if you add sensors to that application and some computer science magic, you typically get a smart X. And this works very well for X in smart meters, in grids, smart factories, smart homes, smart cities, smart phones, and also smart transportation. Um, so um, some other people say, well, we can realize that by the Internet of Things um, in other areas or buzzwords that we had in the previous years, you will find very similar challenges in pervasive computing, in ambient intelligence, in physical computing, and so on. So from time to time, our community needs new buzzwords to kind of make, to show how, how exciting this field still is, to still get research money, and also companies for getting new clients. You didn't do it, you didn't buy it when we called it the digital factory, but now it's a smart factory. You, who want, didn't want to want that? Oh, you don't like English words, let's call it industry if you know it. But, and, and eventually they will buy it. So we always need new, new words. However, the smartness and all these smart things comes from the fact that they use some type of sensors to observe some part of the physical real world and to do with some magic, some kind of clever actions, hopefully. So, and those does here include actuators? Um, yes, they include actuators. Okay. In IoT, they include actuators. In my talk, I will focus on the sensor perspective. But of course, if you think of a, uh, IoT systems, you typically also have an actuation. And it's not only the human being, it's also some automatic response. I will focus on that today. So, um, sensors. So, we, it makes sense to use sensors in these infrastructures. So, I hope that I already clarified this thing. So, Big is bigger than usual, and we talk about new things. So the sensors, um, again, Wikipedia, it's something that transforms a thing in the real world, a phenomenon in the real world, into a digital signal that we can process. So, and we can achieve a kind of situational awareness, so a technical system can learn how to see, how to sense the world by using sensors. Um, and 
as you will see soon, the sensor data is pretty often incomplete. So not everything can be sensed. Not, you cannot sense it all the time. Yeah, so you are missing some effects of the thing you are interested in. Sensor data is very often late. So it's not exactly in the moment when the phenomenon happens, but there's some latency introduced. Yeah, so depending on how long the sensor takes until it gets to the value, I've learned that the official particular metric, Feinstaub, sensors take four weeks to produce a value because they really count every little particle. So they have another technology which does it online, but this is not for the official numbers. So they can do only the online thing for finding out how bad it is. And later they calibrate it with the values that they get from the very good ones that have a four week latency alone in the sensor. But of course, normally we talk about latency because of the communication channel or because of the processing behind it. Um, of course, they are inaccurate. Most sensors don't sense exactly what they should sense, but something close to the value you're looking for. Um, sensors could be mobile, so they could be mounted on moving systems. The most popular example is the mobile phone or a car with sensors in it. Um, so, I've also seen a very funny talk about um, what is it called? Um, so about <coughs> sensors that kind of cling to mobile systems, let them carry around and then fall again off. Um, um, they also really not symbiotic mobility. Um, this is schlecht about the symbiose. Um, Parasitic, parasitic, yeah. It was a talk about parasitic mobility. So little sensors that try to cling to you when you sit on a chair, so to be moved to another room, and then they detect, oh, I'm in another room, they fall off again. And it was really funny. So, but normally you kind of put the sensors deliberately on a mobile system, and then you set some different locations, which is nice, increases the coverage. However, you always need the accuracy then has to be. It's, it's even worse because the accuracy of your location system comes on top of it. Where did I sense it? So, and then the, also the latency is, depends now on your movement model. So if you want to know what the temperature in this room is, you have to wait until some mobile sensor comes to this room and you have and, and, and sense it. So. And to make things worse, we use the sensor data and we interpret it typically. So we put it in, in the magic. So uh, these interpretations, these machine learning methods, whatever you put do with the sensor data stay, of course, in core water. So we have sensors, they observe the world, but it's not perfect. So how to choose now a sensor system? So yesterday we had already this nice talk with the patterns. Um, of course you have to decide a lot of things before you know which sensor you need. So about the phenomenon. Is it a physical phenomenon? Like noise, acceleration, radio signals. Is it chemical? Do you want to see substances in the air? Social? Do you want to monitor behavior of people, of animals? Do you want to monitor the communication acts? Um, or is it a technical thing, a proper operation of something? Uh, do you want to monitor CPU or whatever? So there's, first of all, the phenomenon. Sometimes you need a proxy sensor. You want to actually to sense a phenomenon, but there's no sensor for that. But it highly correlates with something else. So you sense that. So then you also choose another sensor when you actually want it. Then measurement, is it, can you directly measure what you're looking for? Or do you want to derive it? What latency is needed for your application? Is it OK to have the values four weeks later? Or do you have to have them now? Redundancy, do you want to measure the phenomenon by just one sensor? Or do you want to have many of them? Should these many sensors be the same time, or do you want to observe the same phenomenon by different sensors of different types? Um, installation, do I go for static sensors, or do I go for mobile sensors, or a combination? Should the sensors be wired or wireless? Should they, if they communicate, do they do it one hop directly to the gate, to the cloud, to whatever, or do they do multi-hop, do they tail another sensor, other sensor until we finally reach the infrastructure. Um, how about calibration? Um, do I need to calibrate the sensor in the place where it is, or can I just plug it in and it runs? And um, 
aging. So if it's installed, how does the sensor age? Um, how about the battery? It's the obvious aging. But also saturation, chemical sensors, they sense by including the substance on their nano plane and over time the nano is full and then they can't sense anymore so they get saturated. So, uh, or do I have to recalibrate them from time to time because my calibration is a machine learning classification training and the concept drifts that I did. Um, so in general you have a big cost quality trade-off when choosing the sensor system. So you can choose multiple cheap sensors or few expensive sensors and well, it's a huge area where you can choose your sensors. So the sensor management is also an important task in uh, large scale circuits. Um, and for a given use case, if you think this is what I want to do, there are often different ways. This is a quite old paper from 2006. Uh, six ways to tell if you are in a meeting. This paper was more about representing the magic behind the sensor values, but if you look at these different ways how to represent to detect that you're in a meeting, you can easily imagine what type of sensors it could be. It could, you could do it localization. Yeah? Are you in the room? Are you with other people in the room? What does your calendar say? Um, how about the amount of infrared signals from coffee mugs or whatever? So you can think a lot of different ways to tell whether you are in a meeting or not. Here it was focused on mobile phones because they want to turn the mobile phone to silent mode when you're in a meeting. But it's true for almost every use case, you have a high variety of solutions that could give you the needed results. Okay, so you see sensors, high variety, a lot of to choose them, and many systems become multi-sensory systems. So if you want to observe a large-scale infrastructure, you probably end up with different sensors where a lot of these attributes that I've shown you are different. Some are static, some are mobile, some are redundant because they are the same, some are overlapping in space but not in content, and so on. So let's now talk about the data that they produce, sensor data. What comes out of the sensors? Well, they Basic, very basically, they transfer, they implement a transfer function from an input, the state of the observed phenomenon, for example, the concentration of a certain substance in a fluid, and the output is then the signal. It's an analog signal or a digital system signal, and then you have your data and can go on with it. Um, most centers have a linear transfer function, or all of them, but somehow you get this data out of it and can now work with and then you talk, can also decide about the sensitivity, so how much does the sensor signal change when the input changes, so when the uh, phenomenon changes, which is kind of the slope of the transfer function. So, um, if you then have the data from a database perspective, you could then think about, uh, no, that comes later, first um, sensor systems. So this, the top is just about a single sensor, Often you talk, you rather consider sensor systems that are not only one sensor, but it could be more than one, and also some processing unit and some communication unit to, together, so that you have a physical thing that you can install somewhere, and then the sensor data comes out and is transmitted. So it's a little bit more than the sensor itself. Very important if you go for cooperation projects with people who develop sensors, they typically develop sensors. And if you are a computer scientist, you need an, a third partner who does the integration into a sensor system. Otherwise, they will develop sensors and you will never get the data, see the data it's only on their little test device. So you can say a mobile phone is a sensing device, a sensor system, a car is a sensor system, or these are the exterior cameras that we have in our building that do people counting by just looking down. So these are sensor systems that have a lot of processing inside the device. These cameras they have a web server uh, to, to configure the camera. It has the full image processing capability inside. So the images do not leave the camera or the sensor system. They just give you the locations of, of objects, of anonymous objects and how they move in their, in their view and they can count things that cross the fine lines. So it's fully 
privacy aware, we can install them everywhere. It's just that people count them. It's like an intelligent light barrier. A very nice sensitive system, even if it looks like a camera. Um, yeah, and then you get the same data. Uh, you get it in different formats that you have to prepare for. They could be structured, they could be unstructured, or semi-structured if you have photos. And they can happen at different semantical levels. So some of them just are just a signal, and you need to include in your data management some part that interprets that signal to come to a feature. To know this signal corresponds to a temperature value. And I know that the sensor is installed in this room, so I can use it as the temperature attribute for that room. Yeah, feature is the next level. I know what it is, where it is, it is some fact about the real world. Object is I have the room and I can group them to different, I can have different attributes that all belong to this room. Like temperature, number of people, yeah, some, um, and situation, I detect a certain situation. Hey, there's a meeting and I'm in. This would be a certain situation. So you have all these levels that you often need in your application and there could be sensors that provide you directly object level that or a sensor system that gives you a full object description or even situation detection sensors but most of them are rather raw or feature and the other stuff happens then in the magic. Um, and for data-based perspective, the validity is an interesting topic. So what can I do with a sensor value? So if you think about very simple value, it could be one, two, or three, and the time stamps one, two, three, and you measure here three different values at different times. So, and if you then say select T B from sensor data where T is one or T is two to five. So what's the result? Well, um, one is quite easy. I have a value for T equals one, so that's one. And if I would be precise, I would say, I would say if the sensor just sends with fixed frequencies, I actually have no idea what happens between two sensings, so the result should be one and null, because I don't have a value for 2.5. I could say, well, maybe the sensor sends data when new data comes in. Yeah? Um, whenever the value devi deviates, I get a new value. So can I, I can assume that the value is still the same until I hear something new. This is what uh, many people do. So like, I assume it's like this until I get a new value. I assume it's like this until I get a new value. And then I could have the result as 1 and 1.5. So I just assume at time 2.5, I still have the old value, which is around the 1.5 for And if I have a linear phenomenon, I could even try to interpolate or extrapolate between these values. So I could have a, a model on how the values evolve and the sensor values are just kind of points where I know it exactly, like we've seen in the previous talk about that. my measurements, and I try to talk about what happens at the points where I didn't measure, and here it's a time thing, so I could, of course, just have these slope functions, and depending on, yeah, depending on when you query it, now when you query it exactly at this time, the slope function from right now would be this value. If you query it later and you want to know it, you have these two values, then you could have a better function and return this value. You can then interpolate between the two values. This is also a very common technique if the sensors want to reduce the amount of communication. They, they sense a couple of values until they have a nice function, and then they send just the function to the server then both the server and the sensor system keep this function going on and, and you have a delta and if the values deviate from that function too much, they send in the value. So when maybe here the delta is like this. So we found out here that the real value is too low, so it sends makes a new version and then puts the new function in the lower values. And of course you can, there is research about even better functions that you could send out, better methods to get functions than just in the extra or 
So, um, my chair is about mobile systems, so I love mobility as a source for data, so we all know from the physics that if things warm up, yeah, they move faster, so here moves faster. We know it from ourselves, as we move faster, we warm up, so there's somehow a relationship between mobility and heat, but it, it seems to be a modern natural law that mobility also produces data. So whenever you move with your car, you get across so many sensors or cameras or navigation systems. And also we as human beings, we have sensors. We take pictures, um, we write Twitter tweets because we are on, on vacation and so on. And there's also a way to detect based on data certain things, send out data to humans and introduce mobility. So because we are mobile and because things are mobile, we have much more data. So some people already said data is the new oil and they typically have dollar signs in their eyes when they talk about it. But the original blog post about data is the new oil was about the thing that data is like crude oil, a black, ugly substance which no one which is totally useless until you do something with it. So you have to refine it to get all the nice features. And the same is true for data. So it's just zeros and ones. And you have to refine it to be able to kind of do something. So to get, sorry, <laughs> to get information, knowledge, and data. So um, just one example, if you have Google self-driving car, a lot of sensors, it moves and it produces data because it moves and because it needs it for mobility in both cases. They say that it's one megabyte per second. And of course, easily you can uh, say this is per day, it's 85 gigabit, and per year it's 30 terabyte. And, and if it's only 10% of the cars are like this, yeah, we have an even bigger number and so on. But it's not only the self-driving cars, it's also all the modern cars because they already have all these sensors for parking and so on. So, and it's not only the cars, it's also all the traffic infrastructures and the induction loops and all the cameras and so on. So, hey, we have big data kits. So, and people who do big data, they love to do the calculations like this. They just extrapolate. If you would store everything that we can sense, we have big data. And then they come to numbers which correspond to, to Facebook or, or, or Google data sizes and then they say we need big data solutions. Um, so, um, and, they, and of course if you, if you then think about how mobility in the future look like, if we have perfect knowledge about who's moving where and when, we can of course create much more efficient systems. Yeah? Where that which are totally safe, yeah. <laughs> if you just trust the sensors, you can never be harmed. You can just move on, and and by only for for cars, you can also do it for pedestrians or for motorcycles. And yeah, and you see, we need much less space, yeah, for the same type, of, for a lot more mobility than we can. Like quality matters, right? Yeah, quality matters. So if you think here, if, you, if the accuracy or the latency of your sensor data is not good enough, you can easily see what could happen in a system that totally relies on situational awareness. So this is perfect situational awareness, and if you don't have it, well, things look like that. So, um, yeah, if you now say to achieve that we have big data, of course we always have these definitions of big data, the Bs, like volume, it's a lot of data. So if you think about we have data from the sensors, we have to transform it into information, into facts, to finally get some knowledge which we can use, that means data is big. Then variety, the data differs in structure. So that means for this derivation from the sensor data to some fact that you can use, you need all different types of little programs, adapters, methods to do that. And so your system looks more like, I have a lot of adapters to my sensors. Variability, the structure changes, so from time to time you have to adapt these adapters, so um, they don't stay the same, you have to add new ones, you might want to have API backward compatibility when you do that, so because you, it's, it's a big integration problem actually. Change them from time to time. 
Velocity, you have many updates. Yeah, sensors love to send you many updates. So you get all this big stream of data coming in. And you have the veracity in some of the definitions because it starts with a B. So you don't know the source of the quality. So how good is the data that goes into your system? Because then comes all the nice magic, and in the end you have a decision. This guy is a terrorist, so we have to uh, pick him out of the, drag him out of, of the uh, airport. And if you then look closer at what information flows led to this decision, and if the quality is very unclear, it might be very um, uncomfortable for people who are not terrorists. Um, what is very often missing in this list of challenges is the privacy. Maybe it doesn't start with a V. Um, so pretty often in big systems, some of your data that you use is highly sensible. Uh, so it's, it's personal data. You could derive very personal things out of it. And very often, you build the system, your knowledge, it's not personal at all. You don't care at all what individual people do. You want to know what your clients in general will do. You want to learn about whether your infrastructure still works. However, the raw data that you use might be highly sensitive. So the question is, if I use my raw data and derive information which is still very sensible, am I allowed to derive certain knowledge out of it or not? Is that legally okay? Is it ethical okay? Can I prevent certain derivations from others? And this is something where we still are missing so much tools and, and methods to do that correctly. So we are, at this point, there's a lot of anonymization, aggregation things, so that we make sure that the information is kind of anonymous and then often quite useless. But um, if we need to keep the information at a point where it's still sensible, how can we save or secure this step, that's still a very hard one. So, um, if we talk about sensor, we talked about sensor data now, let's look at data management issues. I already gave a little insights into that. So, if we talk about data management, typically what do we want to do? We want to do CRAT. Yeah, um, this um, read. Yeah, how the, of course, we want to create data, so put it in the database. We want, might want to update it, or maybe not. But the sensor data, maybe it's just cut because you don't update the sensor data, you just store the new value. Um, but the read is either by ID, I have a certain measurement ID, and I want to have the value. Often we have queries, like I want to have certain values maybe aggregated over with certain information. So you already see this is an object level query because I have want to group by the location. So you have to have this information already, which is that center is which is where. Or you really do search and you just don't care about the schema, you just have a bad. And also also want to know all the values that are somehow related to that. Um, you might want to have transactions if you do data management. Um, the question is how much transaction do you have to do in, in sensor data? Maybe not that often. Um, and in addition, if it comes to sensor data, you need some pops up or continuous query interfaces because sensors are active data sources. They just send data and you don't, you might not want to call them all the time. You might want to register your read operation and whenever it evaluates the true or you get new data, you want to have a stream of results. So it's a different way of thinking the request response paradigm. I just register for my query results and I get continuous updates on it. So um, for general data management, there are a lot of requirements that you all know from relational databases big ships that give us everything, so it's really like a cruise ship maybe even, where you have full service and you really um, be happy that all these things are taking care of it. And then there are the NoSQL system, like fast and small boats, hey, we are much faster and we have, we support new requirements that the old doesn't support, which always come with a price, so you have to give up some of the old and traditional requirements or neglect them or to um, relax. So, and sometimes it's quite surprising 
what type of data management requirements which you have learned that the system does for you certainly are not there anymore. Well, no choice. So it, from time to time happens, so you have to think about uh, which are you better to, to neglect. And in addition to that area of data storage system or database systems, whether SQL or no SQL, you have these uh, general difference between database systems, which are the squirrels, so they collect everything and put it in their database. So like the nuts, they come in the database during the winter time, and then when they are hungry, uh, uh, during the summer, when they are hungry in winter, they ask queries, where are the nuts, and then they get the nuts back. So it's like collecting everything, storing everything, and of course, if you store all raw data, sensor data, then you need big data databases, because they need to grow infinitely. The data does never stop. On the other side, there's the data stream management. It's like a beer relaxing at a river where the fish flows through. Some of you might have seen these slides before. Yeah. So the fish flows through, and the, and the query is like a certain search as a net. So you register, when you are hungry, you put your query in the stream, and then you look whether there are interesting fish in the stream, and then you get a stream of the best tasting fish out of it, and you let the others go. Of course, if they are really good fish, you can conserve them and put them in the database for later. <laughs> so typically, you have these two systems running together. So you seldomly have pure data stream systems. Very often, you have a data stream system, which has some tasks, and filters out the relevant data, does the um, quick response um, results, and stores everything in the <coughs> database, which is needed for later. And the Lambda architecture is just the variant of, of that idea that you have streaming and storing. So um, the, if you use data stream management system, you typically have some features that they provide you some programming abstraction. And again, it, it depends on what kind of system you use, whether it's more in the SQL declarative way, like the proof shift thing, or whether it's like more on the scripting, stream processing side, where you have to write programs to, to script it together. But in general, you could say it's, it's like using a database management system instead of files, because you have a higher level abstraction on managing your streams. Um, um, you can easily combine it with complex event processing, so either you cre cre create the meaningful events out of the raw sensor data and feed it into your uh, complex event processing system, or some data stream management system also have operators for that that you can include this kind of complex event processing operator in this data flow program that your declarative query has created for the written times. And um, in this graph that is kind of the underlying processing structure, um, the operators are executed parallel, no shared memory, so it's quite easy to, um, to uh, parallelize them. And yeah, of course, because data streams are unbounded, you have, whenever you want to sort something, whenever you want to join something, whenever you want to aggregate something, you have to decide on how long do I wait? <laughs> so we don't have the average. So you have all these issues with approximate ends of end windows. So how big is the window? Is it a five minute window based on time? Is it a 100 tuple window based on elements? How do I represent time? Is it just my the clock, or do I look into the timestamp of the values so that network latency does not lead to wrong results? So, how, my, how, uh, re, um, how correct should my results be? And all these issues are kind of taken care of in a general way in data stream management systems. So, you as a programmer don't have to think about it whether you implemented it correctly in all of your steps. But you just define the window, and then all the operators have the same semantic on that window. And window semantics, it's, it's a hell. So even between different systems of that class, there are like 30 different ways how to interpret window semantics. So a time-based window is not always a time-based window. So, but you don't go into there, but in general, it's a good way to have it at least defined within one system across all operators the same. Because these are little programs that you should write by yourself. Chances are very high that you have all different definitions of 
what a window is, what goes into the aggregation, and what goes not into the aggregation. So if you comp use now data streaming for big data, right, what's the trade-off? You get more velocity, less volume. Yeah? So you have to take care more about the data comes in a fast pass, and you have to cope with it because you can see all the fish. You don't want to miss any fish. But you don't have to store everything. So you <coughs> might reduce the number of volume you only store what you need. So you can do direct processing online in real time at the right time. You get maybe more information, less data. So if you think about these three steps, yeah, you can do all the pre-processing and only store the facts, not the raw data. And you can enrich data streams. You do, can do, start doing even some higher level interpretation, reasoning, and you can do data cleansing in the streaming stuff before you store it. So it's um, one of the nice features that you can do in the streaming. And you can do online quality assessment, which we can later talk to you. That's what we work on. So you can try to observe how good is the data that streams through us and give online feedback or enrich data with confidence values so that the applications can and finally, for the P challenge, the privacy challenge, uh, if you do some of the processing in main memory, you don't store data. Most of the privacy regulations are about storing sensitive data. If you don't store it, if you do all the aggregation and get the non-sensitive knowledge in main memory while the data streams through it, then you can build systems like this little camera that does in a streaming way gets um, the image, which contains sensitive information, and converts it into non-sensitive numbers. And that's pretty nice. And you have your query plans, which are not programs, but operator graphs, and they are defined. You can say, I, let, I, I go to an organization where everyone trusts, and let's get a certificate of this query plan is privacy preserving, because it does not produce any non-sensitive information. The anonymization technique in there is state of the art and the query plan can be executed. This could be also possible. So, um, data management, we've seen there's a couple of systems that we could use and we have the sensors, so how does that all come together to a system architecture where sensors play a role? So you could have the sensors and the application, yeah. And it could be as simple as a request response. The application asks the sensor to give me the data, the sensor asks for the data. And the other way how to interact with the sensor could be I configure the sensor in some way so it uh, continuously sends me the data. Uh, I either send a request response or it continuously sends the data because I configure it to do so. I, um, I could Quickly, if you build a system like this, you say, oh, I should store the data, so maybe we need a database. Um, so then the sensor, the application just previously to the database, and the sensor updates the database. So the data goes in the database and I read it from you. And you could also use a data stream management system, uh, because you say, I don't need to store everything. So I register a query at the data stream management system. I just a sensor there, and then I get a, can kind of have different queries on the sensor data. And of course, I can still store the interesting stuff. I would just just another query where the data is not sent to the application, but sent to the DSMS and store whatever I need to store. And you need some communication. Yeah, sensors, there's different types of communication. You could say the sensor communicates energy over LP band or maybe even over IP or Wi-Fi or fire or whatever and of course you need some communication here. Then if you have one application and you can see oh this is nice what you do with it one sensor, can we have several applications that use the data and now you're happy that you have the database so but still um, but then they say, but we don't want to know about the sensor number, we want to query the world. We want to know the temperature of the room, the situation of our infrastructure. Yeah. So we have to add another layer that creates the semantic that exposes this fact layer, this information layer to the applications. Otherwise, um, I will not be 
it's otherwise very hard to work with the system, so you go into that. And, and then, of course, people will install more centers, some of them, uh, so this application started like the other one, so it has a direct connection. And then people, why don't you give us the filter data too? Because this application already runs into the database. And yeah, and so on. So these systems evol are created in that way that they have mobile centers and find, find out, oh, sometimes they move because they're mobile and they're disconnected. <laughs> so we have to do some way of how to work with disconnected sensors when they reconnect. So you add functions for that. Then you find, oh, my apps do the same. Yeah, do. Some applications are running on a mobile phone and they even get also get disconnected. Yeah, they have also local centers. What do we do with them? Um, and you add more communication channels and so on. So you see, if you let a sensor-based system evolve like normally systems do, yeah, you start with one project and the other one, then it quickly gets a point mess. So, um, so you see what this leads to. So it leads to a spaghetti system where um, yeah, no one really knows what happens in between, but it's still run, but don't touch it. And if you see what the uh, that structures change, that uh, things change, you might have more. So spaghetti code, we all know the results. It's a maintenance health. We have a high redundancy and no reuse. And also the quality is quite unclear. The security is hard to prove that the system is secure and so on. So we don't want to have that. So where are the better architectures? Can we have something as a service that we could just use to build these systems? So shouldn't we help with the standard how to do that? And the nice thing about standards is that we have so many to choose from. So that's a good So. Um, if you go in this field, you find hundreds of IoT platforms of architectures, of reference architectures, many of them without any implementations but, or some just prototypes. However, they all suggest different service levels that they could give you if you use their system. Software as a service, sensing as a service, smart object as a service, and so on. So this, it's a huge field and I will not go into that. Um, and they across all the different application domains. Um, so, um, and yeah, the examples, how they look like, it's always boxes and errors and clever designed components. However, it's really hard to choose which one do I really need, and how can I improve it, and so on. But you see that we have layers. They have a lot of things you have to do. You have to consider interoperability, um, service composition, and so on. So I'm, I'm really happy that yesterday we had this talk about the patterns to the help. So uh, I really hope that this Internet of Things pattern language and usage might help to understand this area better and to make it easier to, to make decisions and then refine this pattern in the platform that you want to use. So this helps. We've seen that yesterday in this talk of Lucas. Um, and if you come to Sensor Data, you have this way to process the data local or remote. Yes, in the discussion we already had that there might be something in between, but most of the platforms still think about the center pushes the data to the cloud. This makes things so much easier, and then we have everything in the cloud. Um, however, this cannot be the final solution for this type of architectures. Of course, one reason is bandwidth. Um, the more IoT systems you get, the more you want to send over the wireless, typically wireless channel. The next one is energy consumption. Communication is still much more energy consuming than processing. Um, and maybe certain application needs like privacy, you might not want to have that data in the cloud. And even the new Bosch IoT cloud have understood that, that if you install things in your smart home, you don't want to have anything of your smart home in the Bosch cloud. You want to have something down close where, where your data is. So there was one movement called edge processing, move the process into the edge of the network, like to the center, and the more generalization of that is fog computing, utilize also further processing nodes on the way. So that you have some gateways between the center system and the cloud that do some processing. 
and layered architecture, and you can move whatever you want to do along this line of data. And if you now rethink, if we have data stream processing, of course there is distributed data stream processing. So if you have a query plan, it's kind of easy to kind of easy also research field, but to decide about the partitioning of the plan that distributes the processing of the cloud. So what do, which operators can be directly in the sensor because it can be configured for a certain threshold? What can we do at gateways in between and so on? And what can we do we have to do in the cloud or do we want to do in the cloud? And then we can adapt to changing situations. So you can say that results of the research of distributed stream management can help to with these data topic in the FOC computer. So we can implement the sensor data management in a FOC computing architecture which is big and has of course a lot of more issues to solve but the data processing along that we can look into that type of research. So finally quality. Um, here we know that we have different issues where bad quality comes in from measurement method and from the processing and some of them can be detected after installation of systems. So we install the system and we make some experiments and then we know how bad is it or how good is it. However, some occur even later. It runs after half a year, we start to get worse data. And many people, clients, believe sensor data because it's a technical system that tells you how many people are in the room. And they believe that more than they're what they see sometimes. So, it's really an issue that if data gets bad, they just look at the numbers and make decisions based on the process. So you can look at different um, dimensions of quality. It could be the accuracy. Um, if you do object detection, it can be even existential uncertainty. You are not sure whether this object or the situation or the thing that you try to detect really exists or not. It's not a matter of plus minus five meters, it's a matter of there is a person or there is no person. I'm not sure about that there is a person, but there is a certain figure really is there. Um, of course, staleness and freshness, so, so how old is the data? If you have high latency, the quality drops in that matrix. And inconsistency, inconsistency between, um, between the sensor values and the real world or in between certain views on the world that can't be true both here. And which dimension is really for your application the most important and which you um, want to observe and want to classify, it depends a little bit on the application, but there is a way to at least have metrics in your box that you can take out, out for certain so if you would build a quality aware data stream management system that helps you in this task, yeah, process the data, why can't it control the quality with it? So we want to have the same programming abstraction but now dealing with them with non-perfect data. We of course need some model so that we can program against this model and then we need to kind of change our operators so that they know all what it means and they get data of that quality. How can we still process it? And yeah, you can determine the data quality of the sensor. So you general idea is the sensor sends a value, and you might have a, already some metadata attached that tells you about the quality. So sometimes the sensor itself knows it, sometimes the algorithm in your system knows what quality, what confidence it has, what support the rule has that it just puts out. Sometimes the algorithm gives it. And sometimes you can, do lear can learn your quality. This requires some type of redundancy. So you can have certain, if you, for example, want to say the quality of your localization system, there might be rooms with a camera system which is very accurate, and you can use this to calibrate the quality of your system. And when you move outside this area, you can keep this accuracy value and take it with you. Or you, if you know that you're standing still, and your location still jumps around, you can use this jumping around expectation maximization algorithms to find out how does my quality in general is diverse right now. 
And then you can store it in a sense of relationship model and can know about what do we know upfront and what can be observed during the operation. And just to give you an example of how we could, for example, represent accuracy, uh, you could have, um, or other quality measures, existential probability, you could say, um, I've detected an object and I have um, a certain probability that it's a car, or I have another probability that it's a bike, and I have a certain probability that it's an unknown thing, which I don't know if I can say. And this leads then to multiple possible words, um, or you can have continuous values like probability density functions, or single values, or you can have covariance matrices when certain values are correlated with each other. And what to do with it if you have that? Well, um, if you, for example, have this kind of discrete inaccuracy, like a type of this object has a certain probability, and another type of another object has another probability, and I want to count now how many objects of which types are there, so what works do I get if I have these two detections of two different objects? Well, in one world, they are both bicycles. In another world, yeah, they're a bicycle and a pedestrian, and so on. So you can have all combinations of these values. Yeah. Since there's no world where both of them can be other, I um, yeah, have zero here, yeah. we can cross out certain worlds. Object B cannot be other because the probability is too low. I could then calculate the probability for each of these worlds. The probability that they are both classicals is zero to two four, and so on. I can do that for all probabilities. And then I can say, oh, I have a winner. World two is the winner. So the highest probability is that we have a bicycle and a pedestrian. However, there's still some chance that it's two bicycles, what I see. You could say I have a threshold and I prune the very uh, in unlikely worlds, I don't take them. It might be a good idea to tell an application our detection says it's uh, one bicycle, one pedestrian with 50%, but there's another chance that it's two bicycles, so we have two values. So it might be interesting for the application that this is just a guess. A very likely guess, but it's still a guess, and the second might be also good. So otherwise, you could just give that information to bicycle, pedestrian, and tell them. Of course, only if the probabilities of these two objects are independent with bicycles and pedestrians, it could be it's very